Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Eric Henneke. I work at Mayo Clinic at our flagship location in Rochester, Minnesota. I have but 30 minutes today to present to you a fairly complex and technical topic as well as a solution set that was promised as part of this discussion. So I'm going to skip past the rest of the formal introduction and get right into it because I understand that you've got an event tonight. I would not want to keep you from that particular event. So uh, I'm happy to see as, as many of, uh, folks in the seats as I do. And I think it's important as we spend time the next 30 minutes talking about supply chain resiliency, whether you're in healthcare or not, whether you're in supply chain or not, this is a topic that impacts all of us. Because at the end of the day, we're all consumers in the healthcare market, right? We all are patients and customers in this market. And the information that I want to share with you today is something that I think is an emerging issue in healthcare. And I think it's important that wide bodies of people understand and know about this risk and what Mayo Clinic specifically is doing to, to address it. Does the date September 13th, 2017 mean anything to anybody in this room? Okay, it does to me. The 13th of September of 2017 was the day that Hurricane Maria hit the, the island of Puerto Rico. And I remember as I was, I was actually traveling for Mayo and I was in Asia watching this on the Weather Channel all night long. And I remember, was pretty young in my, my career in business continuity and had no idea the impact that that hurricane would have on the healthcare industry and, and actually in my career trajectory. The following Monday, I walked into the office and my boss handed me this map. This is a map of the island of Puerto Rico. The words on the map aren't as important, but the colors and the volume of words are. These were all of the manufacturers that we identified on the now dark island of Puerto Rico. And this would have a, a significant ripple effect into the healthcare industry. This was a game changer for Mayo for healthcare and for me and my career. And this set into motion several of the actions that you'll hear the, this afternoon about what we did to combat this issue. Unfortunately, healthcare is, tends to be behind the curve of some of the for-profit industries. And a lot of us sort of looked at each other and went, I had no idea, did you have any idea? No, I didn't have any idea. And you know, shame on us for not having some visibility into this topic. However, um, a lot of people don't understand and a lot of folks in healthcare don't understand the implications that disruptions of manufacturers have to the industry. So some statistics suggest to us that every time a manufacturer has a disruption, the cost to the industry is north of $3 million per incident. Now when we did just napkin math as it related to that specific issue in Puerto Rico, it was in the seven digits of cost for Mayo Clinic, just to Mayo Clinic. It was about a nine month recovery and we had to take really heroic actions in order to continue to serve patients. The primary, for those of you who might be curious, the primary product that we were out of or ran out of was IV fluids, the bags of fluids that you see in every hospital room um, within any kind of organization. So that completely wiped out one of the major players or at least a significant portion of that player in the market was a, a, a large, large dollar impact to us. Now this might sound fairly obvious and intuitive, but for those of us who are in the risk management uh, business, understand that identification is generally speaking the most important component of mitigating risk. And the further up the chain or the earlier we can identify that risk, the better off we all are. Now in the case of Puerto Rico, we realized that when the hurricane hit and a few days later when we realized all the manufacturers that were on that island. But if we're given time, and I think this is true in all industries, if we're given enough time, we can put into motion some of those mitigation strategies that help us in the longer term. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Unfortunately, recovery, particularly in healthcare, is difficult. Anybody work in healthcare? I should have asked that at the top. Okay. So those hands that are raised all know and understand that none of us got into healthcare because it was going to make us wealthy. We aren't going to make millions of dollars at it. There's a certain philanthropic pull that most of us in healthcare have, understanding fully that it's not the highest paid job we could have, we could go work somewhere else for more. The problem, however, is when we talk about recoveries, particularly supply recovery, manufacturer recovery, what that means is a lot of individual heroism. So we see a lot of folks, well-meaning individuals, going out and trying to save the day. It's just sort of how healthcare is. 
And so what that translates into is a, a disjointed, disruptive, and delayed process. And oftentimes what happens, without meaning to, is hospitals compete with each other for the same products. And sometimes the person who's first in line is the one that wins. They're the ones that get the products. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about how we might get around that. These uh, stats are specific to Mayo Clinic, and this was in 2018. So um, we had 25, about two per month disruptions. When I was preparing this presentation, I said to my team, you know, 25 is not a number that I expect is going to be a wow factor to this audience. They pointed out to me that a disruption by our term and our definition is where you go and sort of pull a fire alarm. I mean, it's that significant of an issue. We're talking about issues that can cancel cases, can require doctors to change products, sometimes products that they haven't ever had the opportunity to test or be comfortable using. So we're not talking about something minor. A disruption is a very severe event in our market. Layer on top of that that we had 400 medical recalls, and these are unique recalls in 2018. Everywhere from uh, one end of the spectrum, which is the manufacturer saying, we may have a problem with this device, monitor it, all the way to pull the product from the shelf and pull it out of the patient if possible. So we're having to manage through these types of disruptions on a daily basis to the number of 400 last year. A little bit about the supply chain and what we've seen in industry as one of the core problems. There are several issues that are contributing to what we consider a downhill spiral. And candidly, I want to be very clear, candidly, we don't, I don't, associate the problems 100% with suppliers. I think in a lot of senses, in a lot of ways, healthcare has contributed to this problem. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We know globalization is here, it's here to stay. And so what that means is something that's produced in Asia and is attached to a disruptive event in Asia can have a ripple effect into our market. And it happens very quickly, sometimes invisibly. We get awarded and we get applauded for having just-in-time inventory. And so a lot of times what happens by virtue of the system we've established, we get a product or a device a few hours before a patient's surgery. And that's, that's great until there's a disruption in the market. And then all of a sudden, we're in a scramble trying to figure out what to do. And finally, I'll talk a couple of these other ones in more detail, but we know mergers and acquisitions have, have taken place. Healthcare is no exception. The past few years, we've seen a lot of significant manufacturers come together. And so when you take 10 players in the market and you roll it up into now three players in the market and one of those three manufacturers goes down, it creates a significant disruption, not just to the one, but typically the other two as a trickle effect. So these are some, uh, some themes we're starting to see. Again, our experience, uh, this is the last three years worth of data that we've seen with back orders. Now back orders can be anything from it's not coming today as we thought to there's none left in the market, go figure it out. Okay, so th these are, are wide varying in terms of severity. But in 2018, we saw 16,600, and these are unique items. Okay, these are not unique, there's, these are not a single item that are repeating over and over. That's a double from 2016 when we saw just over 8,000. So this is clearly an emerging topic and a, something that we have to start thinking about in healthcare. And as I mentioned before, we know this, a lot of our manufacturing is starting to take place outside the United States. And this is not a political venue for me to speak about the, the good and the bad of, of whether it's domestic versus international. The point here is to understand that global events are now starting to impact local decisions and domestic types of, of product problems in the supply chain. Um, we know also that uh, China is very involved in the manufacture of pharmaceuticals. And so if you followed the industry at all in the last five years with drug shortages, um, I'm not saying this is a contributor. What I'm saying is this has the potential to make it worse. And so we have to really start thinking differently in healthcare about how we manage supply chains according to some of these statistics. We've had some aha moments over the years and in healthcare we like to get sort of cutesy and so we've added um, an analogy of animals. So we've got here a rhino and a swan and for the um, for, in order to sort of lay the, the context for some of the work that we've started to do, I've overlaid these animals with your classic sort of risk stratification model. So those of us who have ever been an auditor or done any kind of risk management, we typically look at the probability of something taking place against the severity of it happening. Okay, so um, if we look at the rhino for just an, a, a quick minute, 
that's a high disruption, high probability event. So very likely it'll happen, and when it does, it's gonna really hit us hard. Um, the swans are looking at uh, either a low probability, high disruption, or vice versa. And if we start to look at solutions, we can look at micro and macro strategies, okay? And so give, let me give you a quick example of a micro strategy. If we have an event that we think is likely, but it won't have a great impact to us, we could simply add safety stock to our inventory, okay? Doesn't disrupt the market. It's not an event that's burning right this minute. It just allows us to build a little bit more buffer inventory in preparing for something that's likely to happen, okay? A macro strategy is looking at a larger problem and often these really big boulders that we're trying to figure out what to do. And a macro strategy could be something like um, something where we would perhaps build an actual uh, building facility in order to keep buffer stock available, which is different than having extra inventory. It could be ma vendor managed, etc. I'll talk through another example of something we did in that space. So this is where my team came into formation. This was right before the hurricane of 2017. And my group is, um, at least in healthcare, is a, as I understand it, a fairly unique group in that our focus and our goal is primarily business continuity supply disruption. And our goal is to be able to do these four things. So we want to be predictive, detective, preventive, and, and mitigate any risks. I'll talk a little bit about what that means. That's uh, really fancy words for not a whole lot until I give you some context and examples. A couple other problems just to be aware of, and I think these are probably true outside of healthcare and, and not unique just to us. How many of you as kids played the game Mousetrap? Okay, so if you've played the game Mousetrap, you understand that it's, it's a series of levers and switches and balls, all of which have to function correctly for the trap to drop onto the mouse. Supply chain is exactly the same. If any component of that falls apart, it blows the whole system up. And so that's how we often think about um, how products actually get to our doors. Oftentimes, non-supply chain people just assume, oh, well, the truck pulls up and it's here. Voila, it's very simple. But it's, a, it's really not that simple. There's a series of very intricate steps that gets to your door. Here's one of the um, most difficult issues that we've been dealing with, and I suspect this, again, is not unique just to healthcare. So on the far right side of this graphic, you'll see an acronym, it's OEM. That just simply means, means manufacturer, okay? So let's just take as just a basis of context, the manufacturer, and it doesn't matter what the product is. Every manufacturer in the world has a series of suppliers that supply it, whether it be widgets to go into the device, whether it could be someone who does packaging, it could be somebody who does logistics work, it could be somebody that sterilizes the product. Dozens of examples, okay? And so let's call those the first tier, supplier A, B, and X, okay? What often happens, however, is that supplier also has a supplier, who also has a supplier, who also has a supplier. And when you start really thinking about this in your head, you become quickly overwhelmed with the volume of suppliers to just service this one manufacturer. Now in healthcare, probably not unique to other industries, we have pretty good visibility as to where our manufacturers are, because we've asked them. But if you get further down the chain into their tiers and their tiers, very little if any visibility. Now there's two reasons for that. The first one is, I think a lot of times manufacturers have so many suppliers and suppliers of suppliers, they just simply don't know. The other issue is we often hear that there's a cloak of confidentiality and that information can't be shared with us. So what that means is, when we're trying to identify global events that might impact our supply chain, we're already, we already have a gigantic blind spot because we don't have access to a lot of this information, even though it would be very useful to have. I'll give you a live example of something that's happening right now that brings this point forward. Um, I won't name names. You, some of you in the industry might be familiar with this, uh, this supplier. So we have a facility, a company, with a facility in a suburb of Chicago, Illinois. In the last few weeks, the EPA came in and shut the facility down. It's a sterilization facility, okay? So our vendors use this facility to sterilize their products that eventually end up on our dock, okay? So when we became aware that this 
fairly significant player had been shut down, we reached out, I reached out to them personally and said, tell me the vendors that use your facility. You want to guess what their response was? I'm not going to tell you that, <laughs> which is what I expected. And so we have been trying to stitch together the last four weeks all of the vendors, all of our vendors that potentially have products going through the sterilization facility because it's only a matter of time as long as these doors are closed. It's only a matter of time before this has a ripple effect into the market and we start to see back orders as a result, okay? And so, again, just driving home the point that once you start getting into sub-tiers of sub-tiers, the visibility very, very quickly um, becomes foggy and if, if, if not impossible. Okay, one more point. We in healthcare have, have probably made this problem much, much worse because we've required of vendors perfect pricing, which is counterintuitive to resiliency. So think about it. If we're constantly pressing on pricing, <coughs> is the vendor likely to, to have the cash flow to be able to do any kind of investing? Probably not. So the, um, the phrase I've heard before is uh, quality, quality and price pick one. Okay, and so that's the situation that we're up against is we're, we're actually working against ourselves from a resiliency standpoint by insisting on the cheapest product always. Okay, I'm gonna skip through this example. Um, I wanna step through now some of the, the corrective actions that we've started to take at Mayo um, and, and kind of walk through what those look like. So this graph shows you a little bit about the various players that are involved within our own walls when we become aware of some disruptive event in the market. So the sterilization event is one that is front and center right now. And we have multiple parties working together to try to fix and figure out what this situation might be. So going from left to right, we have our contracting uh, colleagues who have a direct interaction with a supplier kind of at the sales VP type of level. Okay, so that's a, a contractual relationship with the vendor. Procurement, so those are our folks that are placing the daily POs. And those are the ones that are having the interactions with a different segment of the business that oftentimes triggers a clue that there's a back order or there's, something, there's some sort of problem with that thing we're trying to purchase. So that's one other group. Business continuity is my group. And then um, look going up into the right operations. So those are the folks that give us signals, both demand signals as well as stock on hand signals to tell us what we have on inventory in our facilities. Um, value analysis, that's a group unique to healthcare. These are just some folks who, have, uh, who are RNs, who have an understanding of the practice and help us to sort of um, interpret what a doctor wants versus what a, a supply chain operations person would be doing. Um, and then finally, the practice. So we've established protocols that give us signals and give us signals to signal to the practice, to the physicians and nurses of a potentially disruptive event. That gives them some time then to make choices. And not choices when there's a burning fire, choices ahead of time. So for example, we're aware of a couple of vendors that we know are impacted by the sterilization shutdown. We can tell them what products we purchase from them, what products are potentially impacted, and then start to give them some choices. If our, sh our shelf goes to zero, what will you do? And that gives them some time to ponder. Does that mean we cancel cases? Does that mean we go to an alternative product? Does that mean we take an unsterilized product? Any number of examples. So that's how we engage our practice as well. We also have a set of eight and growing items that are on at various stages of maturity that we're um, working on pretty diligently. And again, coming back to the micro versus macro, you'll see some of each kind of sprinkled throughout. So I'm gonna kind of step through a few of these um, that I think are most pertinent. First one is business continuity plans, or BCPs for short. Most of you, in your, uh, in your efforts and in your organizations, more likely than not have a business continuity plan. Simply put, a business continuity plan is an if-then statement. If a tornado hits downtown Rochester, these are the actions we take. If a flood hits downtown Rochester, these are the actions we take, etc. Okay, And usually they're site-specific or location-specific. We have these in place for our facilities at Mayo, but we think it's important that our suppliers have these in place as well. And furthermore, we're starting to insist on a few things. Number one, they have a business continuity plan. Number two, they're willing to share their business continuity plan. Number three, 
they're willing to hear feedback from us once we've reviewed the business continuity plan as to what they're missing. And fourth, and probably the most prickly, is they're willing to let us audit their business continuity plan. Meaning we will show up at your facility with the document you gave us and audit you against it, okay? Because I think a lot of us understand that procedure on paper means nothing unless you're following the procedure, correct? So that's, uh, that's the premise of a BCP. The second thing, the second and third items are the ones that I'm most excited about and I think have the most legs in terms of long-term viability. So uh, this idea of external risk intelligence. So mo some of you probably know that um, there's this thing called the internet. And the internet has a lot of really interesting information. It also has a lot of garbage. We've come across a couple of interesting companies that actually do uh, basic web crawling. And they look for events that are taking place around the world that could have some sort of a ripple effect on your business. It doesn't just have to be supply chain. It could be any area. And these really AI types of machines just go out and search for keywords on websites and then start kicking reports back to you to give you a, a sense of what might be going on in the world. We think this is a really interesting concept and again, it's probably been around a long time. We've just never had a use necessarily to use it. But telling you of events is only part of the equation. So let me jump forward to data analytics. In order for this to be, I think, impactful, we not only have to understand the event that's taking place, but what it means to us. And so this is a, a real map that we've created, it's a geo map. What we did is we reached out to our top 100 vendors and we said, tell us where your facilities are located. We'll plot it for you, okay? And we asked them for manufacturing facilities, distribution facilities, really any footprint that they have globally. So that's the US map. And this is the, um, interestingly, the world map with a, a large, per, uh, large footprint there in um, Europe. And what we've done then is to take the event that we've been made aware of and we bring it back to what's going on with our vendors. And so, for example, if we see that a nor'easter is coming and we see in the, cons the upper, uh, the northeast part of the United States that we have a large concentration of suppliers there, might we reach out proactively and ask them what their plans are? And that's exactly what we're doing. So we would ask vendors things like, are you aware there's a nor'easter coming? Sometimes they don't know. But more importantly, we ask things like, what are your redundancy plans? What are your business continuity plans? If you have a facility in, for example, New York, and we think that that is gonna be a hard hit area, do you have a back facility in Nashville? Or do you have a distribution center maybe in South Dakota? And we start to ask those questions so that we can have some sort of predictability as to what the disruption might mean to us. Okay, so we've done a little bit of that with data analytics. Let me back up. In addition to that, we have to understand our own house. And I've been really surprised in talking with others, um, both inside and outside of healthcare, that folks don't know what's on their shelves. They have no systematic button they can push to say we have this much of a product throughout our facilities. And Mayo is actually no different. We have a pretty good idea of where some of it is, but once it goes out into the ORs, or out into the facility in some fashion, we tend to lose sight and visibility very quickly. And so we've used data analytics along with geomapping and along with some of the event watch services to really reel in, you know, how much inventory do we have on hand? Are we at any kind of risk? What are the types of things that we need to be worried about? Tying all of those various aspects of data together. Uh, the fourth thing is um, an emergency operations center. Now, most of your organizations probably have some sort of a, a disaster response type of function. Uh, ours does as well, so if, you know, Rochester's gotten hit with a couple blizzards this year, if a blizzard hits the city, um, what are the types of things that we need to do from kind of an emergency ops perspective? So this is a little bit different. This is actually a supply chain centralized EOC. And there's a series of triggers that would enact or enable the EOC and then it's, it's intended to be sort of an agile exercise where we can call a meeting in five minutes and we can get into, the, into a room those players that I mentioned before, contracting, procurement, um, my group, uh, some of the operations groups, et cetera. We can get them in a group, a quick huddle, figure out what our risk exposure is and make decisions timely. This is very different than what we've seen in the past which was just sort of, oh, the shelf is empty, now what do I do? We're actually starting to proactively manage this which I think is really important. I mentioned buffer stock. So I, I, I 
discussed earlier that our largest black eye in Puerto Rico was IV fluids. And we made a conscious business decision that that particular item would never stock out again. We would never have that problem. Time will tell if, we'll, if we actually have gotten ourselves to resiliency point. But we actually made a, a, a business decision to carry a buffer stock of fluids, which we consider to be a critical uh, life-saving item. It's something we have to have for our business. And so um, our main distributor, I'm sorry, our main manufacturer agreed to carry a whole warehouse full of backup IV fluids and it's not necessarily just for Mayo, it's intended to be a health, kind of a healthcare stockpile, if you will. And it's, of course, something we pay for. It's more or less an insurance policy. It's insuring us against catastrophic loss of a significant asset, something that we would need. And so we have a facility in the Midwest, I won't tell you where, but somewhere in the Midwest that's safely away from all their manufacturing facilities that if and when the time comes, we can simply issue a purchase order and directly pull from that buffer stock warehouse. So that's an option. Failure to supply is another thing we've been looking at. And this is, this is sort of interesting. So this is the stick approach with the supplier. And this is something that retail has done for years. And I know this because I used to work in retail before I came into healthcare. This is simply that we contractually obligate our suppliers to deliver what they say they're gonna deliver. And if they don't, they write us a check. It's that simple. Now the problem with this, of course, is when our, our shelves are at zero, no check is going to help us with patient care at that moment. So this is really not the best approach, but an approach, something that you could consider. We also scorecard our, our main suppliers. As you can imagine, some care, and some really don't, you know, frankly. And so that's an option from a supplier standpoint. And then strategic sourcing is another. I wanna bounce forward to something a little bit more broad, but something I think has a little bit more in terms of legs for a long-term solution. So we, as, a, as an industry, as I mentioned before, we, while we collaborate in healthcare, and it's sort of a unique experience in that we sit across from the table of, uh, of really a competitor and have conversations about best practice, we often compete when it comes to a, a business disruption such as this. And so um, instead of competing, we think that there's a model, especially in healthcare, for collaboration. And being able to openly discuss emerging risks, things that concern us, and then a mitigation strategy. And this goes well beyond the walls of Mayo, as you can understand. Um, we think that probably more importantly is we need to find a way in healthcare to create transparency with suppliers. And whereas we have traditionally seen a guarded relationship and one where a supplier, you know, either just chooses not to tell us or, or can't tell us what's going on with their supply chain and their manufacturing. We really think that something of open communication and dialogue and preparing in advance is a lot more logical solution in the healthcare space. And so as a result of that, um, we have designed, we're in the, the, really the infancy stages of designing a formal infrastructure as to what this would look like in healthcare. And there's really, kind of two sides to this. So the providers, which are the hospitals, what we really want to be able to do is identify which items are critical. By the way, if you ever ask this question of anybody in your facility to name your critical items, what's the most common answer you receive? All items are critical. So if you ever ask that question, just be prepared for the answer. Everything's critical, okay? So there, there are systematic and mathematical ways that we're looking at to identify critical products. We also want to know where they come from and some of the resiliency actions of our suppliers. Now, in exchange for the things that the providers want, we expect that there's, there's got to be something in it for our suppliers as well. And so um, we feel, feel, particularly in this market, this low margin market, that suppliers are likely to come to the table if we incentivize them with being able to say, we've got a great story to tell. We have a resilient manufacturing operation. Our distribution channels are working flawlessly. We have re redundancies in our supply chain and we're prepared for disasters. And we think that at the end of the day, that is potentially a large monetary gain to a supplier. And so we're hoping to bring these two communities together um, and, and start some really active dialogue, again, across the healthcare perspective, not just us. Um, so I'll show you this sort of what this looks like um, with a mission, vision, values type of statement. And again, 
I've outlined a lot of the things that, that we hope to gain as a supply chain um, and what the suppliers, what we hope that they'll gain out of this as well. So I am at my time, um, but I would be happy to have a conversation with any of you interested in this topic. I've provided my information here. Please do reach out. I will unfortunately not be at most of the event as I am speaking on this tomorrow on the other side of the country. Um, but I, I do welcome any dialogue and feedback questions that you might have down the road. So please do reach out. Thanks for your time.